The joy of the Lord be your strength. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Oof. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the sons of witness church. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. I'll explain that in a moment. I want you to go to Joshua chapter 3, verse 9. I'm reading out in the New American Standard. I see you got New Living Translation. You can still follow along. I'm reading out the New American Standard. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will assuredly, everybody say assuredly. Now shout this with me. Dispossess. And I see y'all got New Living Translation. Today you would know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out. I actually like that better. He will drive out. No, shout it again. He will drive out. Then he named them Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites. Ahead of you. Give me the next verse. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which is symbolic of the glory of God, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan. I want to talk for the next few moments. Can I get a witness? Let's pray. Father, thank you. For the edges of thy word bringeth light. Your light shines in dark places. I thank you for the light of your word. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Your word is a hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces. Your word, O oh Lord, is settled in the heavens. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Hmm. Your word is like honey in our bar. We receive your word. And Father, help us to de preach it, declare it, help me to say it, and articulate your word. Get me out of the way of your word. Hey, hey, hey. And let your people receive your word with meekness. The engrafted word of God, which is able to change their souls. We give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. On your way down, just rub, rub, just rub against somebody's shoulder and say, hey, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Answer that question. You all can be seated in the presence of Jesus. <clears throat> Y'all ready? Hear the rules. I need you to talk to him a little bit because if you talk to me, it encourages me. Number one, I'm not from Charlotte. I'm from Texas. That's number one. Number two, if my Texas uh, growl or my Texas slurs get in the middle of what I'm saying, you're going to catch it because I'm pretty articulate. It's number two. And number three, uh, let's have some fun. Y'all ready? So I want to argue this real quick, apologetically, for the, for the sake of what we're, our discourse is going to be together, is that Moses, is, in this particular context of this message, does not represent a man. Moses does not represent a human being. For the context of what we're saying, Moses represents an administration. It represents a grace. It represents a culture. It represents a school of thought. It even represents a movement. That's what Moses represents. And Joshua, for the sake of arguing, does not represent a man today. It represents the next administration, the next grace. Y'all hear? The next school of thought. 
or the next culture, the next thing that we're doing. And so according to the scriptures, uh, Joshua is at a place now where God has a conversation with him. And God speaks to him after 30 days of mourning the death of Moses. That Moses, my servant, is dead. What you've always known, what you have been akin to, what you have been moving with has now changed. And after 30 days of mourning uh, what we're going to do next, what is it going to look like, what I stepped into is not the way I thought it was going to be. Everything has shifted. 30 days later, God speaks to Joshua and tells him, hey, that's over. Get ready to go into what's coming next. I made some promises to you over there, but you're going to see it realized now. Look at somebody telling him Moses is dead. <clears throat> so Joshua chapter 1 begins, like any other book, as a book of transition. As a matter of fact, I would even like to argue that the entire Torah, is a books, a collection of the transitional nature of the and transactional nature between God and his people. They are books of transition. But specifically, I want to argue for a moment how Joshua is all about transition. But before we can get there, we have to rewind the tape to figure out the context of why we are in transition. It's beyond death. And let me help you argue this for a moment, that transition is a change or a shift from one state of something, a subject, a place, or etc., to another. It's from one place to another. Shout that with me. Transition is moving from one place to the next. Moses has died. The people are mourning and God is ready for the people to move into transition. But who are the people? The people are born between two places. The people that are now mourning and grieving or should I say anticipating what's about to happen next are either a people who remember what was or people who have been born in the wild. These are people between the wild and the promise. There are two groups, those who were either rescued from Egypt, who are now older, or those who were born in the wilderness. And Exodus gives us content to this journey. Are y'all here? So the book of Exodus tells us about the story of the birth of a people in slavery and ends with the nation's establishment of its own center, its leaders, and its own symbols of freedom. Exodus chapter 1 details a list of Joseph's descendants who lived in Egypt. Let me lay the foundation. It opens up about a people who ancestrally work, farm, and share within an Egyptian culture. But in chapter 1, verse 7, we start to see increase for people. The scripture says in verse 7 that the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. In other words, Israel now began to develop skill and expertise in an Egyptian system while maintaining their own unique culture. And because of that, they became intimidated to the people who were the majority in that region. And they became strong and they became a unified people. And because they became so unified, the particular strong man of that region could not handle their growth under difficult circumstances for them that now a pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. And this particular pharaoh had a conversation that we must annihilate them because because if they continue to grow and they continue to, 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 to master these skill sets, they will outnumber us, connect with some of our enemies, and overthrow us. We must annihilate them. The intimidation of this pharaoh and his government and his administration began what we now know as abortion. They said, we got to take out every boy child that is born. It's not the first time that Egypt does this. It's not the last time Egypt they did this in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. But it's the first time we see it introduced, the idea. The Hebrew says it like this in the Torah, that when you see the two stones, take the child's life. The stones are not representing of birth stools, but stones represent the reproductive organs of the males. In other words, when you see the two reproductive um, 
equipments. Yeah, uh, we're working within, working within the male. Take that child's life. It was a, it was a, it was a scheme to cause the people to become dominant, feminine. Uh, a, a scheme to cause the man to be not just emasculated but annihilated. It's a scheme that we still see in today's churches and administration. It's to cause men not to come and rise up. So when we see the man annihilate him as a child so that he never embraces the government and an administration of a people. It's abortion. It's abortion. I'm, I'm not set tripping, but it's abortion. Shout out with me, it's abortion. It, it, it's the annihilation of the man because if I take out the man, I take out the family unit. I take out legacy if I annihilate a man. If I assassinate a man, I mess with a people. If I assassinate a man, I can take out a people group. It's the idea of abortion. It's first a natural than the spirit, but it's the idea of abortion. And so now in this context and in this culture, years of this is going on. Time is going on. We assume that this happened at just one time. No, this had been happening because Pharaoh is intimidated. Isn't that like the enemy? To He is so intimidated by your skill set, your mastery, your education, your prowess, the anointing, and the mantle. But the first thing he does is come after men. This is why when you get connected to an expression or to a place, you got to be careful because the, the scheme does not begin in the women. Mm -mm. The scheme begins with the men. And when men get to the place where they no longer look for the affection of the oh Lord Jesus, we already see the scheme working. Y'all quiet today. The scheme, it's all in the text. We see the scheme working to cause men not to procreate with the women. Israel is moving at a place now. Y'all don't get mad at me. It's all in the text. I'm just, he told me, go here. I'm going here. So the transition be, was because they begin to outgrow their environment. Israel is used to transitioning because of how well they grew. Their first transition is out of freedom into bondage. Now they are enslaved into the Egyptian system. They are enslaved. Shout enslaved. enslaved. And the most interesting thing happens is while they're enslaved and while they're going through the context of what they're going through, God raises up a kid. And this little kid is one who is special. His mom gives birth to him. He's Hebrew. She gives birth to him but there's already a decree to assassinate his life. And so she decides that I got to find a way to make my kid safe. So she places her baby into this ark of bulrushes. Y'all know the story. And she pushes him on down the Nile River. Can I argue the Nile River for a moment? The Nile River was very interesting historically. I am by nature a historian. I love that. I love that stuff. I am a nerd. But what I've learned about historical Nile personalities is this. They had hippopotamus by the Nile. They had snakes and serpents by, by, by the Nile. They had scorpions, listen, by the Nile. And the water was oftentimes very nasty, so you could not drink it. Uh, and lastly, uh, they had crazy nomadic people that live by the Nile. This is historically speaking. Uh, and so when this happened, you're talking about a place that where God, or rather Pharaoh annihilated these people, they drowned these kids in the Nile River. That's how they took them out. Are y'all here? And so now Moses is in this ark. And he is floating down the river where all of his young colleagues are deceased. It, it's, it's the mark of a deliverer when, when you survive what people around you did not survive. It, it's the grace of a person who is anointed to do a whole lot because what took your, your high school friends out is a thing you, you survived over. It, it's, it's a thing when everybody else was shot and dry by shooting somehow. You weren't even grazed. They, they, they died at 19. You made it to 40. It's this, it's, this, it's this thing where your cousins and everybody else had babies way before they were supposed to have children. But God kept you in such a way 
that you waited until you was mature and married to have a family. It's, it's, it's the mark of a deliverer. Look at somebody name and say, are you a deliverer? Are you a deliverer? Are you a deliverer? Are you the first of your family? Are you the first one in your city? Are you the first one in your bloodline? Are you the first one not to look like everybody else with your last name? Are you the first one not to be hooked on narcotics? Are you the first one not to be an alcoholic? Are you the first one not to have tracks in your arm? Are you the first one to graduate college? I don't look like those that died in the Nile. I look like I've been in the ark. Woo! I look like I've been in an ark. I've been, I've been. So, so Moses is in this ark and they push him down the now. Hey, Bob. They push him down. Help me, Holy Ghost. They push him down the now river. And uh, it's interesting because when he's pulled out of the river, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter sees him and they know there's a decree to kill them. But she pulls him out, and they name him Moses, one who's been drawn out. It's amazing how God hid him in the house of those who were trying to kill him. Only the only. That's beautiful right there. I don't have time to argue that. I got to get to the other stuff. But, uh, but, but the scripture says, if it, whatever frustrates, well, the scripture show, doesn't show this, but I have this statement I, I like to say, if it frustrates you, you create to solve it. That your, your, your gifts and your callings are not your why. Your frustrations are your why. That's why some of you get frustrated because you're using your gift as purpose. And God said, I never called you to be an artist. I let your musicality be a part of your why. Lord Jesus, it's to help you with your why. You want to find your why, find why you're frustrated. Because when God makes men, he makes men as, as he gives you the DNA of answers. Your DNA is made up of answers. Lord Jesus. That's why you shouldn't cause problems. Because you are an answer. Are y'all here? Your parents weren't necessary. They were convenient. You were coming regardless. Y'all don't, y'all don't. Galatians chapter 4. When the set time had come. God sent his son born. Come on here. You, you and I are answered. That's why you have deja vus. Because you saw it before you got here. And every now and then you're like, hey there, hold on, hold on. Don't nobody move. Your spirit is responding to something. He showed it before you said yes to come. You are an answer. Look at somebody down here and tell them, I'm an answer, I'm an answer, I'm an answer. Be careful how you treat me. I'm an answer. Be careful how you respond to me. I'm an answer. And so Moses has the DNA of an answer. He don't know it yet because he's a baby. Can we argue for a while? So Moses doesn't know he has the DNA. He, he's pulled out and his enemy names him his purpose. <laughs> she calls him Moses, which means one who is drawn out. Not knowing he has the constitution to pull a people out. Mm -hmm. So we see that context with Moses. We see him hidden. We see him hidden in Pharaoh's house. He grows up. He becomes a graduate of Pharaoh University, uh, the first HBCU in the world. <laughs> he's a top scholar at this HBCU. He's, he's, he's leading the people. And now he starts demonstrating he starts demonstrating signals of his why without knowledge. Because there's a place you can get to as a believer where you start demonstrating your why without information, without revelation. Are you here? Let me prove it to you. One day, he sees the taskmasters whooping on the Jews. Now, he's raised as an Egyptian. And something in him is angered. So he assassinates two particular taskmasters. What was happening was, is that without revelation, you can become dangerous with your gift. So without information, he began to know he was supposed to defend the people, but he didn't have full revelation of what he was called to do. Therefore, he took the likes of two people 
because he didn't understand his why. What do you do when you, you know your burden to do something, but the way you're articulating what you're burden to do comes out wrong and it hurts other people. So now he's in transition. He's automatically kicked out because he got to be on the run. And he hides out in Midian. And Midian means strife. He hides out and God sends him 40 years in strife. <laughs> and the reason why I think he sent him there for as long as he did is because Moses had to learn in strife how to deal with the people he was about to bring out. Let's walk for a while. He learns how to tend the flock. He's tending Jethro's sheep, and he's dealing with Jethro's sheep. He's learning the administration of how to lead with a staff, how to make sure everybody's in line. He learned all this in strife. He gets married in strife. He, gets, he, <laughs> he has children in strife. He builds a family in strife. Uh, he's, he's working out his gifts and his calling in strife. He even meets God in strife. He walks up to God. God is burning a bush. A bush is on fire and the presence of the divine is inside of it but the, the bushes is not being consumed. He inspects it. When he inspects it, God speaks to him and gives him revelation about what he's been feeling for the last 40 plus years. So you'll take my people out. He's like, you want me to go? You want me to go? And You want me to go over there and say that? You want me to do that? He's like, yeah, okay. Well, who do I tell him send me? God says, Yahweh, which means I am God. I am, I am, I am God. I am not just God, but I'm Elohim, which means I bring my whole agency when I come. Tell them I got the whole realm. Just tell them the one who holds the realms is coming to you. And when he brings him out, when he brings them out, he walks in. Can I walk? I feel like I can do this at home. He walks, he walks in to, to, to back to Egypt. And everybody's like, man, it's been a minute since we seen you, Moses. Been a minute, man. You know, uh, that's some smoke. <laughs> Your name has not been taken off the charter. We, 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 you are wanted. <laughs> Moses comes in and says, hey, man, Pharaoh, God says, let, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, y'all know the story. I ain't going to go. This ain't beat to you. But he goes through the whole nine. Let my people go. Let my people go. And you know God sends the plagues, etc. And now this people who have been crying out to God for 400 years, God finally answers them. And the first thing he does is he sends them into transition. For 400 years, they've been taught what to learn. They've been skilled. They've been trained. They've been manipulated. They've been held back. They've been stripped of some of their culture. They've lost some of their native tongue. For 400 years, they've been trained in somebody else's educational system. For 400 years, I'm talking. For 400 years, for 400 years, you have not been able to necessarily have family with who you want to have family with. Certain families were arranged and certain people were extracted out of the family. For 400 years, you may have been shifted to another area of Egypt to work. For 400 years, families were broken up. And sometimes Egyptians took advantage of Hebrew women against their will, even though they were spouse to another 400 years mm -hmm. 400 years of oppression 400 years of slavery 400 years of possibly not even knowing your last name 400 years of not knowing exactly where your line age is and who you're connected to 400 years 400 years of this and God hears their cries and God says I'm sending Moses I'm sending a deliverer and Moses he brings these people out and when God brings these people out they, they meet transition at the Red Sea the enemies are baptized, <laughs> which is prophetic to some degree because it's the first baptism. Egypt goes across, their enemies are swallowed. Egypt goes across, their enemies drown, right? And so uh, what happens is they led into now the wilderness. Now let's work. The wild is where God fed them because the wilderness is transition. Say that with me. The wilderness, the wilderness. is transition. And transition is moving from one place to the next. So the wild is where God fed them. They learned to be a follower. And they learned how to follow a leader in the wild. They followed a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They learned God's voice in the wilderness. They heard his voice in the wilderness. They even learned how to fight in the wilderness. And though the wilderness had its challenge, the wilderness is necessary. Yeah. 
And my argument for us this morning is that we cannot curse where we've been. Because the wild was necessary. Oh, Jesus. The wild is always, whatever, whatever you survived out of has always been necessary. And my problem with many in church today is we like to curse where we've been, not realizing the tools we gained while we were there. God will use the wild to shape you and sharpen you and position you for what he's going to do next. Without the wild, you're not qualified for promise. Without the wild, you're not qualified for what you're about to come into. Without the wild, you're not, you're not refined enough. Oh, Lord Jesus, please don't give me promised people that don't have a wild past. You need people who have history in chaos to understand and respect the volume of what God's got to bring me into next. Wow. That wild experience taught them. Hey, Lord Jesus. I love my church because sometimes in San Antonio, my San Antonio church smells like weed. And I get excited about that. Not because I like the smell of weed, but because I used to smoke weed. And it reminds me of my seasons, y'all quiet today, in the wild. And every now and then, God likes to staff you with people that are where you have been. So because if they've been where you are, where you were, you can lead them to where God wants to take them next. You got to have the wild. You got to have the wild. It's in the wild where you learn to trust God. When I remember when I first got saved, like many of y'all, I am born, let me just, let me tell you, I was born, I am a fourth generation preacher. I am a third generation Church of God in Christ kid. I am Kojic to my roots. It's all the way down to the bone. It's in my grandfather's DNA. I am a Kojic, YPWW, Bible band, sunshine band kid. I am a Kojic baby with roots all the way back to Bishop C.H. Mason. That's my roots. However, we even with all of that, I took two and a half years off from church because of y'all. And left that and alum do Allah for two and a half years of my life. I went to Islam. I went to Islam, and while I was in Islam, I had walked away from Yeshua and adopted the idea that Muhammad was actually God's real prophet and that our original relationship with Christ or with God rather was not through the Hebrew Bible but, but through the Quran. And I would pray to Allah, alum do Allah five times a day with my face turned to the east and I learned the disciplines of prayer but I came out of that ideology because I never felt the presence of Allah why because he's not real but the reality is when I came back to Jesus it did something because I spent some time in the wild you got to be processed in the wild if you're gonna come into what God wants to do next The wild taught me how to, oh Lord Jesus, the wild taught me how to pray, yeah. The wild taught me how to fast. The wild taught me how to be serious about my constitution. The wild taught me how to read. The wild taught me how to study. The wild taught you how to dance. The wild is the reason why you have joy because you got a story and if you can't be processed, you're not ready for Canaan. God said, I can't take these people in here like this. They don't even know me. My God. Oh my. Let me introduce myself. Jesus. Let me introduce who I really am. They transition into now what we call culture. God gives them festivals. He gives them feasts. He gives them laws. He gives them rituals. He gives them rules, not Egyptian rules, a whole new set of rules. These are the rules from where I'm from. I want you to realize how sovereign and how holy I am. I got to teach you how to deal with me. And you can only learn that in the wild. It's in the wild where God will feed you manna. It's in the wild, Lord Jesus, where he will feed you with the birds of the air. It's, 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 it's in the wild where you're led by a cloud by day and a pillar of illumination by night. It's the wild. It's scary out there, though. I don't even want to lie to you. There's Amalekites in the wild. There's all types of enemies in the wild. And while they're sitting out there, we have no recollection of Egypt ever calling, I mean, rather, of he the Hebrews ever trying to cause a revolt in Egypt. 
But we do see them fighting for the first time in Exodus. And they fought in the wild. Mm -hmm. They learned how to squabble in the wild. They learned how to defend themselves in the wild. And they got so strong that their name became great. That every enemy that was sitting in the wild was intimidated by them. Because he had been refining their tools. Here's the problem. God gave them skills. He gave them Egyptian gold and <laughs> Egyptian resources. He gave them food. He gave them insight. He gave them his presence. He gave them leadership. He gave them rules and festivals and structure and government. And they still complained. Mm -hmm. They still complain. He fed them. He fed them every morning. They had so much of what is this that they didn't know what to do. They, their stomachs were full. They, they, not, they have never eaten that much before in their life, but they complain about the abundance. And you got to be careful in the wild because in the wild you'll learn that sometimes your freedom can enslave you when you're so used to bondage. This is why a good, a good man can be messed over by a woman. Who wanted a good man, but because she's used to getting hit upside the head, she'll mistreat, mistreat that one because she likes the chaos. <laughs> oh, Lord. I, oh, did I do something wrong? I stepped in, I stepped in something. You felt that room go, did you feel it back? We'll mess up a good relationship because we're used to bad ones. We'll mess up good friends because we like toxic. You say you don't want toxic. But you pick up the phone for toxic. And for the good people, you say you're too square. It's, it's what we do. Because we, when we're in the wild being processed, God has to change our appetite. We used to eating slave food. Now you're getting manna. And we don't know what to do with that. Because manna don't taste like the hood. Oh, my God. It's different when you're being in the wild. Am I born, y'all? They transition. Shout transition. God has given them generational structure and generational instructions. He's, he's, he's given them this. And now, after all these years, Moses has been leading these people. Moses does something crazy. Moses does a small thing. God says, Moses, I want you to speak to this rod. And when you do it, the water's going to come shooting out of it. I'm paraphrasing. Moses says, all right, God. But he was so aggravated with the people in the wild that he struck it instead. God said, that's not what I told you to do. And I can't let you take that attitude over there. So now you're suspended. I can't, I can't bring you in because you can't lead in that mindset. You were so close. It almost worked. We were right there. Moses represents the generation of almost. We almost were there. I almost graduated. I, I almost got married. We almost stayed together. I almost had my family together. I, I, I almost started my business. I, 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 I almost became an entrepreneur. Y'all quiet. I, I almost relocated. I almost joined. I almost left. It's the idea of being right at the brink of what God wants to do and then you blow it. So many times we get close because God is doing it. It's, a, it's apparent that God's hand is on us. It's apparent that he's using this. It's apparent that he's present. But because we don't know how to deal in the wild, we will blow it in the moment because of the people. And when we blow it, God suspends you from it. But here's the good news. He only suspended that administration. He didn't suspend the entire administration because Joshua saw everything Moses was doing. Huh. Joshua, hey, 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 saw everything. He saw the good choices. He saw the challenging choices. He saw the difficult choices. He saw the wise choices. He also saw the disobedience. He saw it. And when he saw it, I think he took note of it. And he said, okay, I can't do that. It doesn't make Moses bad. It doesn't make what Moses is doing crazy. It just means I can't blow this moment. He had Caleb with him. Caleb, who was a little bit older than Joshua, also saw. And they had a different administration. So now... 
God does something for Moses. Y'all ready? Um, can I just have a theological test moment with you? The Bible says that God took Moses up. And you know, Moses had asked God for years, show me your face. And God said, no man, Pastor Chris, can see my face and live. Which means you can't, it's the word pan, panim, which means to the opening. He said, show me your opening. Show me the opening of you. <laughs> show me the better sheet. Show me the, the, the genesis of you. He says, no man can see what I'm looking at and live. Uh, let me see. No man can see that and live. So I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand on top of it. And I'll walk past it. I'll take my hand off of it. And I'll show you my hind parts. Stacy, I'll show you my history. Let me see. It's not my history. It's my history with y'all. I'll show you where I've been. This is why Moses would say in Genesis chapter 1, better sheath, Elohim better sheath in the beginning, God. When he says this, bara Elohim, when he says this in the beginning in Hebrew, he's writing from Revelation. Y'all do know Moses wrote Genesis, right? How did he get it? In the cleft of the rock. He starts writing backwards what he saw. And when he writes backwards what he saw, he writes what he's seen. And therefore, we have a demonstration of what God did because God showed it to him. I believe that before Moses died, now I, I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to ask. <laughs> when, we, when you get there, if I'm there before you or you're there before me, when I get there, just remind me. Tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, Apostle Duhart, let's go ask about that thing you said in Charlotte on the 24th of March in 2024. Remember that? And we'll just, we'll, we'll, we, well, we won't be walking like that. We'll be walking straight up, right? When we get to him, I'll ask him. We'll ask him together. <laughs> we want to know. But I think, I wonder if when he took him there, the scripture says Moses' eyes were not dim. Why would it tell us that? Why does the Bible want to tell us, preachers, listen to the scriptures, why does the scripture want to tell us that his eyes were not dim? I think, I wonder, I wonder, theologically speaking, did God show him him? And did it consume him? Because there was no body. Lord Jesus. The scripture says in Jude that the archangel Michael and Satan wrestled over his body. So God buried him. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. I, I just, I wonder what may have happened to Moses. But anyway, Moses is dead. The people are mourning. There is no body. Because the enemy knew if I keep him above ground, Israel won't go in. They'll try to throw his bones in the Ark of the Covenant. So I got to take care of it. 30 days later, we're in my text now. Moses, my servant is dead. It says, the word of the Lord came to Joshua, the son of Nun. It's a shadow and type of Jesus and a shadow type of God. I'll prove it. The word of the Lord came to Joshua. Joshua is Yehoshua, which is the root for Yeshua, Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. It says the son of none. None in Hebrew means posterity. It means it never has an ending. There's no ending. Joshua, the son of none, posterity. It's always going. You get it? It's a chattel type of Jesus. He says, Moses, my servant is dead. Arise and go over this Jordan, you and all witness church. What am I trying to tell you? Your last administration is dead. And I don't want to act like everybody's happy about that. Because <laughs> in the 30 days of mourning, I'm not even certain Joshua was excited about that. So God had to disrupt their mourning to pull them into promise. Letting them know your wild season has ended. You're at the Jordan where you was dropped off. 
They were at Jordan. Jordan is a place of decision. It means descender. It's a place of decision. It's not a cute river. It's actually quite dirty. Historically speaking, it's a muddy bank. It's not white sands and beautiful. I was in Cozumel two weeks ago. It's not Cozumel. It's not, it's not Jamaican beaches. It's not Jamaican beaches. It's not, it's not the beaches of Italy. No, no, no. It's, it's nasty Jordan. It's a river banks. It's a low running river. As a matter of fact, it was so nasty that Naaman, when they asked him to be baptized in it, he had a problem with it because it's a nasty river. I'm too bourgeois to go into that. Can you put me in a pool somewhere? This is nasty. It's, it's, it's a nasty river. They were at the brinks of a nasty, shallow place before they could step into what was promised to them. I'm talking to Witness Church right where you are. You're at the brink of the thing you saw that he had to process you for over the last four and a half, five years of your existence. Oh, I feel like I need to talk to y'all. That God showed it to you. Hey, hey, hey. He showed it to you. Now you're here. And it's been consistent transition. Just like Israel. All we know is change. Help me, Holy Ghost. All we know is surviving. All we know is a pillar of a cloud by day and fire by night. All we know is we get fed, but we don't know what's what. It's been, it's been tears. It's been lamenting. It's been fighting. We felt dropped. Where are you, Lord? Are you here now? I'm trying to understand. We didn't have COVID. Some of us got sick. People left. What are we doing? This is the transition. And God says, now y'all right here. So what you going to do? He says to Joshua, he says, Gibbs, I'm sorry, Joshua. What you were doing is dead. I loved it. It's just gone. And you have the right to mourn. You just can't stay there. You got 30 days. And then you and this people got to go over. I told you the first part's going to be hard. Here's a participation. He had to warn him. It's going to be a fight. He says, I want you to meditate on that law daily. Woman of God, there's no place in the scripture that speaks to success. I know we like to say that. God want me to be successful. He want me to be successful. Success is in the Bible, one place. It's right here in this text. You're not going to find it nowhere else. Mm -mm. And it don't even mean what you think it means. Because we like to westernize the Bible. It makes us slow over here. We like to westernize the scriptures. It does. It makes us slow. Let me give you true context. The word success there, he says, meditate on the word day and night that you may make your way prosperous and thou shalt have good success. It means to be circumspect. You know what that means? To make good decisions. Success is making good choices. Success is not money. Success is making, if you make wise choices, resources follow wise decisions. You make dumb choices, poverty follows your decisions. If you make wise choices, resources are attracted to wisdom. Are y'all here? He says, meditate on the word day and night. You'll make your way prosperous and thou shall have good success. But let me tell y'all something. It's about to be a fight. They're not going to give it to you. Mucklenburg and all these other, they're not going, it's not just going to yield to you. Charlotte's not just going to yield to you. They are enemies in the land. And if you're going to be a witness, you're going to have to fight, not against flesh and blood, but against the strong man's in the region that's been occupying space before you got here. And he warns them, there's some ites here that you got to take down. So I started praying. I said, Lord, why do you want me to go to this? He said, because Charlotte's going to find themselves in this text and do what I told you to do. 
Because I had a whole other thing I wanted to preach. I wanted to get y'all like, eh, you know, I wanted to go. I'm a coach. I want to pull it, you know. You know, I want to ride. You know what ride means, right? I want to ride, man. I want to just, and just, you know, step. He said, no. <laughs> you're going to stand in your office, and you're going to talk to them about what's coming. And he took me to y'all. Can I find you? Joshua 3. It's amazing when you know a moment's prophetic because you can find yourself in the text. There was nothing more powerful than finding yourself in the text. I'll prove it to you. Jesus walked into the synagogue, said, give me the scroll. Well, maybe not like that. They gave him the scroll of Isaiah. And he opened it up and turned to the part where it said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he, he found himself in the text. You don't believe that? Okay. Well, Peter, they come down from the upper room. I'm giving you a witness. They come down from the upper room. And when they come down from the upper room, the people are saying, well, these men are drunk with wine. He says, no. He found them. And this is that that the prophet Joel spoke of. Well, witness church, Joshua 3 is your charge. The Lord said, hey, hey, hey. The Lord said to tell you this, family. I want you to look at verse 10 of Joshua chapter 3, verse 10. Please throw that up there. Whatever version you got, I think you had the New Living Translation. I need everybody to read this with me. This is our charge for the next few moments, and this is what we got to do today. You ready? He says, today, shout this with me. Today. You will know, come on, that the living God is among, uh-huh. He will surely drive out the Canaanites. Hittites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, and the Stop. The Lord told me to tell you all that today we start to fight. We're about to cross over the Jordan. The Ark of the Covenant is already ahead of us. When the woman of God led worship, I felt the glory of God. I said, okay, you're here. Now what we got to do? Follow it. But here's our fight. The first spirit we're going to have to contend with, and you're going to have to contend with in your church and in this expression, you ready, is a Jebusite spirit. Let me tell you what that means. It means to trodden down. <laughs> in Hebrew, it means to trod down. This tribe was a people who are discouraged, overwhelmed, and defeated. These are people in this congregation that uh, deal with guilt, condemnation, shame, and the spirit of heaviness and depression. If that's been sitting on you, then we got to contend before we leave this building with the Jebusite grace that's been sitting in this house and sitting in this region amongst God's people. To think of depression. The Jebusites are those, it's that spirit that comes to make you feel like secluded. It, 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 it tries to make you feel withdrawn. It tries to, it tries to isolate people. It tries to, it causes you to get up in the morning and say, I don't need to be there this week. I can just go next week. Or I'm going to take the next week for my mental health. My mental health, right now, my mental health has been bothering me. And I've been, I've been, I need to mentally have a mental health break. And the mental health break becomes a month off. And then we don't see it. And people try to find you and call you on the phone. And you, you know they're calling you. You don't answer. Or you pick up and be like, Hey, and you give them shallow answers. It's Jebusites. Jebusites whisper to cause you to feel beat down. Nobody sees me. I really don't feel seen. I really don't feel, con I don't feel connected. I really don't have a community. It's the Jebusite spirit. It's that thing that pushes you into a corner that makes you like that Bart Simpson me. Just fall yourself right back into the bushes. It's a Jebusite demon assigned to houses in this region to cause people not to connect. It's a spirit. Ho, ho. It's a spirit. We're going to pull it down. He's going to drive it out. We'll, ident we'll identify it. He'll drive it out. Shout, 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 drive it out, drive it out. 
We may talk about it, but he's going to drive. As a matter of fact, let's start right now. Lay your hand on your head. We pull down the spirit of discouragement and depression and isolation and fear of connection and rejection and abandonment in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we call that thing out. Holy Ghost, drive that thing out by the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Loose God's people, let them go. Up and out, up, 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 up and out, up and out, up and out, up and out. Every jump your sight, grace, jump your sight, whisper, whisper in your dream, whisper in your subconscious. Every lie the enemy told you that you can't connect and be a part. You are a liar, a trespasser, and a thief. It tries to make you not connect. Hey, hope. It's a demon. Jebby sites are demons to make you feel like you can't connect. It's a downtrodden thing. Every season you are discouraged. The enemy telling you you're about to have a nervous breakdown. Who is that? I just heard it clear as day. You're about to you're gonna lose your mind. And you came into agreement with that foolishness. God wants to deliver you from that. But that ain't the only demon. That ain't the only ite. They had the Gergeshites. Hold on. They had the Gergeshites. One more second. They had the Gergeshites. Who were the Gergeshites? The Gergeshites were the dwellers of the clay. They lived in the marsh areas. It literally means to compromise. <laughs> this, is, this is the spirit that comes to cause compromisation all over the room where we no longer have standards. We just let anything fly because you're gifted. Mm. You, you expect to do anything because you are an asset to the house. No, no, no. When you come in entitled, feeling like you must be paid for everything you do, it's the compromisation. It's the Gergeshite. It's the, it's the scripture says in Revelation 3.15 that I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold, but I wish you were cold or hot. Pick a pick pick one. Well, are you going to be with God or not? Are you with the house or not? Are you talking about the house or not? Are you connected to the leaders or not? Are you plugged in or not? Because if not, go somewhere where you can find community. But as for me and witness church, uh, whether you be, pick one. Look at somebody tell them, pick one, pick one, pick one. Come on, touch three people down. Pick one, pick one, pick one. You either in or you're out. You either down or you're not. You either rolling or you're not. You either riding or you're not. Either you're connected or you're not. But pick one, please, whatever you do. Either you're here on Sunday or you're down the street in Mount Nebo. But pick one. Be somewhere. Pick one. Pick one. Pick one. Pick one. You a Christian or not? Are you burning incense or praying? Which one? Pick one or not? Pick one or not? Whole house smells like Little Caesars. <laughs> burning sage and oregano because you're too dumb to know the difference. It's burning. It's your spiritual rocks and foolery. Jesus said it best. I don't let rocks cry out. All creation bows to knee. You got to pick one. You gonna have to drive out that Gergeshite in the house, Apostle. You gonna have to. You got the work gives with the Gergeshites in the house. You have to deal out and push out the compromise. Be a Christian. You can't be a Christian and a Black Hebrew Israelite. You got to pick one. Number one, they denounce Jesus. Oh, I got time a day. I don't care. I spent time in Islam. I'm qualified for this. Let me tell you. You already a hypocrite. You mix your you mix your fabrics. You got t-shirts on with denim. You already messed up. You're smoking weed. You already messed up. As a Jew, you're supposed to obey the laws of the land. Polytheism is not a law you can follow. So if you got more than one, you already messed up. Ye hypocrites. And number two, number th last week, we don't live by the law. We were Gentiles. 
And if you want all 613, good luck. Right. Don't go to Papa Do's no more. I'm going to seafood for you. Leave the lobsters alone. Don't touch it. Quit putting that edge, that razor on your face. You hypocrite. How you got braids in a hairline you, and, and it's edged up? You a liar. I don't want it. So not just that. So the Gergesites are compromised. The Jebusites is their downtrodden. I got another one that you're going to have to deal with. You ready? It's the Canaanite. The Canaanites were different because the Canaanites, the Canaanites was one of the greatest enemies of that time. And it's also one of the greatest enemies of the church today. It's the spirit of coveting. <laughs> it literally means out in the Hebrew, you ready for this? Materialism. It's, it's, it's that thing that sits over Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the thing of resource. Right. Education. I came here because I'm who I am in corporate. I got Esquire behind my name. I am. Oh, I know where I'm at. I've left Atlanta to come here to, to build in the new Mecca, the new, the new baby Atlanta. I am I'm buying me a house out in so-and-so where we live, my neighbors. Like this, I, I got this, I got that. It's materialism. Right, right, right. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And it's the arrogance of when I come, they need to know who I am. It's what, it's what I bring to the region. It's who I am and what I do. And oh, y'all not, we're not trying to, y'all, y'all not trying to connect. Oh man, you, you a hater because it's materialism. Are y'all here? Yeah. It, it's the idea that separates. You know, because we call it black excellence, but a lot of time it's, it's, it's a Canaanite. Right. Lord Jesus, it's not Jack and Jill, it's Canaanism. That's what it is. It's separatism. It's, 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 I'm educated and you have a high school diploma. It's, it's, it's the arrogance. It's, 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 and it's not even said, it's implied. You can tell by the piety of, of how you walk in. I am Candace Owens. I am, I am the mindset of trying to make people feel a certain kind of way. Canaanites. It's the ones who serve money. God promotes you. You've been begging for the job. God gives you the job, and then all of a sudden, you stop coming to church because you got to work. It's, it's, when, it's when, hey, I'm going to step back from what I said I was going to do for a season. You know, God is really leading me into some stuff, and in, in I got I to gotta really stretch my gift out in the marketplace right now. I feel like that's what God's got me going. So I'm going to start this podcast. I'm talking about this money I'm getting, how I'm doing it, because I feel like God wants me to level up and kind of help other people get to that place of business, because I'm finally it's six figures. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm finally getting there. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? You feel me? I'm finally getting to that place where it's, it's Canaanism. Canaanism. It's an arrogance. It's a Canaanism. You got to deal with that. Here's the other, the other eye. You ready? Here's the other eye, and I promise. Because listen, until we get through these, we crossed over. And once we get out of the mud, it's scrapping time. Hear me, family. But on the other side of these fights, they got grapes bigger than your head. On the other side of this fight, there's, there's, there's locusts and honey on the other side of this. There's, there's, there's milk and honey on, this. on the other side of this. There's land to occupy, to spread out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm almost done. Here's the next eye. You ready? Everybody say the Hittites. The Hittites, the Hittites simply mean fear. They were a fierce nation that brought terror and fear into the hearts of their enemies. And one of the ways the spirit of fear works against our destiny is insecurity. This is the thing that whispers to tell witness church, you're not good enough to come. Lord Jesus. I know people got 16 campuses around here. I get it. But witness church. But witness church is, y'all quiet. But witness church has a mantle as well. And you got to refuse to think that you don't have the thing that's going to set you apart and make you distinct and peculiar in this region. 
the enemy will try to whisper to you that y'all don't have the skill set. You don't have the musicality. You don't have the band for that. You don't have the preaching for that. You don't have the education for that. You don't have the leadership for that. You don't have the team for that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And it's what the Hittites do. They try to make you insecure. That's in this, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. But it's the spirit that sits over the region that's been sitting and resting in this soil for years to intimidate people. But in the name of Jesus Christ, lift those hands. Lord, I thank you that you're releasing a people that have broke covenant with fear and intimidate hey, and terror. But they will not be terrified as they build. It's when God tells you to start a business and you're too afraid to do it. He tells you to go back to school and you're too afraid to do it. He tells you to trust this relationship and you're too afraid to do it. Some of y'all, God has told you to connect to this church. You've been dating them too long. Quit dating. Make a commitment. Come up out of the mush of compromise. Make a decision. But you're afraid that if you join or you partner, that somebody's going to take advantage of you because the last church did. Well, that ain't every church. Let me tell you something else. Part of being a Christian is willing to risk getting your heart broke. Y'all don't like that. I get it. But you can't build walls and call yourself a Christian. Ministry is people. And people mean ministry. You can't say you love ministry without loving people. You got to let your heart be willing to be broke. And trust him to defend it and trust him to cover it and trust him to heal it. But some of us too, we too guard it, which makes me think you really don't know God. You're not ready to come out the wild. This might not be your season. The next one was the parasites. I'm almost done, y'all. I got one more after this. Child parasites. The parasites were the open and the unwalled. That means they had no defense. They were just easy to ramp. They, had, they were unwalled. This is the tribe that was roaming tribe that never bothered to secure their dwellings by building a city. They were always unprotected. This is the spirit of immorality. It's when you have no convictions. We have to be careful that while we're building... We're not operating in a space with no convictions. That we have convictions about what we will do and what we will not. And this is not just the pastor. This is the house. Leaders, I'm talking to you specifically. Because how you look in public is not just what you do in public, but also how you live privately. is going to impact the future focus of this house. And the last spirit, I'm done is the Amorite. I got two more, I'm sorry. The Amorite. Shout Amorite. Amorite. That's pride and rebellion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bitter rebels. That looks like haughtiness, self-edification, unforgiveness, self-righteous attitudes, rebelling against the leadership, right. murmuring and complaining. Right. You ain't got to understand. You just need to comply. Here's the question. Here's the litmus test. Is it sin? Then obey. Is it harming somebody? No? Then obey. You don't have to understand. If God has to correct that leader, he'll shift their heart overnight. But if he doesn't, obey. Last one is the Hivites. And this is the one that lies openly. It's the spirit of a false tongue. The rumors and the accusations. It represents humanism. It's an evil spirit at work in the world. It's the idea of let God forget about, let's forget about God and do it ourselves. It's a lying spirit. We have to pull that thing down. If we're going to move into this, this next space and be a witness, we got to contend with these particular spirits. Y'all ready to pray? Yes. Stand to your feet. Did y'all get that word? Yes. Next time I come back, I'll holler real good, but I had to stand in my office. I had to stand in my office.
Let me tell you something. Transition is not fun. Well, let me rephrase that. It's not always fun. But it's always necessary. And if you do it with the will of God, it's one of the most momentous moments that can happen in the life of a church. Every church should experience transition. A leader passes away. Uh, new leaders come in. You move to another facility. You change the name of your church. You connect to something new. You disconnect to something God's not doing. Whatever that looks like. Transition is always necessary. Say that with me. Transition, transition. is always necessary. But how you respond determines the health of what God's going to do next. Y'all right here? Y'all right here? But today we're crossing over the Jordan. I got a few moments to pray. We're going to cross over the Jordan. This is what we're going to do. Where my intercessors at? I'm about to employ you. If you need to, take your shoes off.